uh, starting today's session with basics of the graphics processing unit. It is a specialized computer processor which addresses the demands of uh, real-time high-resolution 3D graphics compute, uh, compute intensive tasks. Uh, GPUs have evolved into highly parallel multi-core uh, systems allowing very efficient manipulation of uh, large blocks of data. Its design is more effective than general purpose uh, CPUs uh, for algorithms in situations where processing large blocks of data is done in parallel. Uh, in 2006, NVIDIA introduced CUDA, which is a general purpose parallel computing platform uh, and programming model. It uses the parallel compute engine in NVIDIA GPUs uh, to solve many complex computational problems in a more efficient way uh, than a general purpose CPU. CUDA has several advantages over traditional general purpose computation on GPUs using uh, graphics APIs. So here uh, we have uh, Dr. Rupesh Nasre, who is an associate professor at IIT Madras. He completed the PhD from IAC Bangalore and postdoctoral fellowship from uh, University of Texas at Austin. His uh, research focus is in compilers and parallelization. He is a recipient of the Young Faculty Recognition Award at IIT Madras, Cray HPC Award, NVIDIA Special Prize for Code for Science, a winner of the Yahoo University Hack Day and holds five US patents. He is also the head of the National Supercomputing Missions uh, Nodal Center at IITM for training in high performance computing and AI. Uh, Dr. Rupesh's group named Gajendra focus on compilers and parallelization. They have developed a domain specific language for graph algorithms, efficiently compute cycles in a graph with the millions of vertices and uh, learning how to deal with evolving social networks. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing you from, uh, we are looking forward to hearing from you, sir. Uh, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Vinita and Rahul. Um, I'm very glad that uh, I got this opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, and thanks to IEEE, uh, uh, IEEE student chapter at NITK. Uh, this is my uh, third interaction with NITK. Once I had actually come uh, to your campus and uh, Professor Basaraj Talwar had uh, uh, hosted me. Uh, for uh, a talk related to graph algorithms on GPUs. Then I was also uh, a, a PhD examiner for one of the students. And this is the third interaction. So uh, before we uh, uh, get started, I would like to uh, state clearly that uh, the introduction that Vinit has given was very nice with respect to the GPUs. And I'm, since we have limited time, uh, I'm not going to get too much into uh, uh, whether CPU is better or GPU is better and so on. If you have those questions, feel free to ask. Um, but uh, I'll probably focus more on the programming side, which also means that uh, if you have direct access to a GPU, either on Google Colab or AWS or somewhere else, maybe on your laptop, uh, you might just want to try out the codes as and when we go along. And feel free to ask questions anytime. You just unmute yourself and ask. I suppose that facility exists. Uh, because I was told by Rahul that chat may may not be enabled. So in case chat is enabled, you can write there also. But I am likely to be more on the presentation, I mean, the uh, uh, application. So I might not be able to view the chat. But anyway, you guys can uh, uh, decide how you want to ask questions. OK, so with that, I'll uh, switch uh, to the uh, presentation mode. And that will switch off my video. Uh, All right, and uh, one small uh, suggestion that uh, you'll get the best out of this talk if you keep aside your phone so that you don't access WhatsApp in between. Right? So, okay, so let's get started. Um, so I'm going to directly jump into the coding part, right? And then as we go along, we'll uh, learn a few aspects of GPU programming. GPU programming can't be learned in two and a half, three hours. Um, and I was also told that you guys have just finished your classes and you must be very tired. So uh, feel free to pick up your favorite uh, water, drink, whatever you want to uh, get in or food and continue uh, listening to this lecture as well as participation. So Hello World in CUDA is what this program is doing. And you can see that there is really nothing different than what our C or C++ language is, right? The way I compile this program is 
instead of using GCC or G++, I'm going to use NVCC, which is a compiler from NVIDIA. And uh, uh, that creates, let's say, on Linux systems a dot out or uh, hello.exe on uh, a Windows machine. And I can run it by typing that command or double clicking on that uh, application. Right? And uh, it turns out that this gives the expected output printf hello world, just prints hello world. Right? So then doesn't seem to be a big deal, but that's good. But that also indicates that any C program that we have can also be combined using NVCC. This is not a program which is actually running on the GPU. This hello world gets printed by the CPU. Uh, GPU is a separate piece of hardware, which typically, uh, and uh, therefore it requires a different uh, way in which we invoke a computation on the GPU. So let's do that in our next part. Um, so here I'm going to show you, uh, I'm showing you uh, a way to call a function which is running on the GPU. Right? The name of that function is dkernel. It gets invoked with three less than and three greater than operators. Within that, I specify two numbers separated by comma. And then there are parentheses which specify what are the arguments I'm passing to that particular GPU function, right? GPU function is called as a kernel. That kernel is written like what we specify as a normal CPU function, like void something, right? The return type of this function is always void. Uh, and uh, you, it will become clearer why that is so. Uh, in addition, I need to specify a, a, a particular mnemonic called underscore, underscore, global, underscore, underscore, and that defines that this particular function can run on a GPU, okay? Uh, so this we'll call as kernel, and the function call we call as kernel launch or kernel invocation, okay? Uh, in addition, I need to have inclusion of CUDA.h for all of this to work out. And then I'm ready to go. I just compile it again with NVCC and I again invoke a dot out. But unfortunately, earlier my printf hello world was working on CPU. Now it, when I try to do it on the GPU, it is not working. So why does that happen? Well, that happens because uh, I need to specify some small function called CUDA device synchronize after I have launched a kernel. That is after, after I have launched a function on the GPU. Uh, what does this CUDA device synchronize do? Well, it just says, tells the, uh, 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 let's say CPU to wait for that kernel to finish and then go execute the next part. What does that mean? That means that if I do not have CUDA device synchronize or I'll just use the term CDS, if I do not have CDS, what? the CPU is doing is that it is starting execution from main. It will execute some instructions if those are here. Then it is going to not only call the kernel and wait for it to finish, but it is just going to call the kernel and not wait for it, right? In general, when we call a function, until that function is over, we don't execute the next instruction. The CPU doesn't execute the next instruction. In this case, since GPU is a separate device, the CPU can just tell the GPU boss, go ahead and execute this dkernel function. Meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and process the next instruction because these two are separate processors. The GPU is a separate processor, also called as a coprocessor or an accelerator, and CPU is a separate processor. And therefore, they can execute two things in parallel. So without CUDA device synchronize, it is just going to go ahead and possibly finish execution and therefore it might not wait for the GPU to even print this hello world, right? And therefore we might not see any output. When I add CUDA device synchronize, at that time CPU, yeah, question. Okay, any other questions? OK, so when I add the CDS, the CPU doesn't go ahead. It, uh, it again launches the kernel. That is, it just tells the GPU, OK, go execute this function. It goes to CUDA device synchronize and then waits there. It's like a loop, 
right until that kernel is over it's not exactly implemented as a loop but until that kernel is over on the gpu it is not going to execute the next instruction right and therefore you will see the hello world um, output all right any questions so far please feel free to unmute and ask can somebody type a chat message just to quickly check if uh, chat is enabled for you in case it is not no worries but sometimes students are more comfortable writing in the chat okay so it doesn't look like uh, it's working all right so uh, i'll move ahead since there are no questions the takeaway from this particular slide is that or whatever we have discussed so far is that the cpu function which in this case is main but you can call the kernel from any cpu function and the gpu kernel these run asynchronously asynchronously in that sense is called as parallel but asynchronously mean that they don't have any coordination amongst each other right so it's not that uh, the cpu is by default going to wait for the kernel to be over right so it is both the kernel and the cpu main or whatever function is executing those are going to run in parallel and therefore we have to be a little careful at times especially in the initial days when you are not comfortable with using cds all right so uh, let's do that for uh, another example i am going to now extend that example our kernel remains the same in main i am just going to call this kernel multiple times i have not yet explained what is this one one but think about it for now is that i am going to launch this kernel on the gpu with a single thread right a multiplication of these two numbers decides how many threads are running on the gpu right uh, and some of you who might have some background knowledge of gpu you must have heard that you can launch a gpu with thousands of threads sometimes even millions of threads and so on and then you will probably get a little disappointed when i am launching it with single kernel but hold on to uh, it for some time we'll uh, increase the number of threads soon so now i launch three kernels one after the other from the main function after that i have cds and after that i have a printf from the cpu which prints on cpu okay um so how does this execute just for our understanding it by default all the gpu based kernels they execute sequentially one after the other so one kernel can be parallel but by default d kernel first invocation is going to finish before d kernel second invocation is going to start and same for d kernel 3 therefore you will see the three hello worlds being printed one after the other there won't be uh, the case where the first invocation is going to happen second and then the second invocation is probably going to print it first right so that is never going to happen uh, there are ways in which these kernels can be made in parallel can be run made to run in parallel but the way i am showing that is always going to be sequential however cpu and gpu are in parallel therefore cpu needs this cds it is going to wait here that means it is not going to yet execute this printf on cpu until all three kernels are fully executed and therefore we are always going to see the output as three hello worlds followed by on cpu okay. all right so uh, if there are any questions feel free to ask otherwise i'll move ahead okay so i am going to then probably ask you to uh tell me uh, what printfs can execute in parallel so again our gpu function is going to get launched by a single thread again three times 1 2 and 3 in between i have added cpu 1 cpu 2 cpu 3 then cds and then on cpu so you have to tell me which printfs are going to execute in parallel anyone
uh, sir, probably CPU one and Hello World. Okay, CPU one and Hello World will probably be executed in parallel. Okay, any other suggestions? Okay, so let's understand what is happening. And uh, my fear is that if you are not able to, if you if you know the answer and didn't give, that is okay. But if you did not understand, please feel free to ask because otherwise things will just get more and more complicated. Okay, so let's understand what's happening. CPU starts from here. <clears throat> it launches the kernel asynchronously and then starts executing the next instruction. And therefore, as Vinit said, CPU one can possibly execute in parallel with hello world. Right? Until printf CPU one is over, CPU is not going to go ahead, right? So our printfs are in some sense blocking or synchronous, right? So the, there is only one uh, thread on the CPU which is running this. And therefore, until the printf is over, you are not going to launch the second invocation of the kernel. So you, at that time, is it guaranteed that the first invocation is over? No, there is no such guarantee. The first invocation might not have even happened. But as soon as printf CPU one is printed, the CPU is going to go ahead and launch the second invocation of the kernel. Thankfully, thankfully, we know that two invocations of the kernel on the same GPU have to be executed in parallel. And therefore, until hello world is printed by the first invocation of D kernel, another hello world is not going to happen. Right? Um, but let's, uh, uh, so let's, the first invocation then has to happen. But let's say that both of them are waiting. Both of them have not yet executed, right? So that is possible. In that case, the CPU is actually allowed to go ahead. And therefore, since it has printed CPU one, it has launched both the kernels. Therefore, it can execute CPU2. CPU2 is guaranteed to be printed after CPU1, but it can execute in parallel with any of the two hello worlds. Right? It might happen with the first one or the second one. Uh, after CPU2 is printed, the CPU goes ahead and launches the third invocation, which might also get just queued up. It is not yet executing or it might get executed also. Either way is fine. But the CPU is allowed to go ahead and print CPU3. And therefore, CPU3 can technically be parallel with either the first hello world or the second or the third one. CPU3 will always get printed after CPU1 and after CPU2. After that, there is a CDS. And therefore, the CPU cannot go ahead. And therefore, on CPU is always going to get printed after all the kernels, I mean, all the three hello worlds and all the CPU one, two, three have been printed, right? So I hope this part is clear. If there are any questions, if something is unclear, feel free to ask. I have a lot of slides. Don't worry about that. I will not fall short of slides. But the important thing is I need not cover everything. But the, the crucial part is here is that whatever I cover, that should be understood by most of you. So uh, unless you tell me that you have not understood something, I might just assume that you have understood. So please feel free to interact. I'll not scold you, I guarantee. OK, any questions so far? OK, so then I'm going to move ahead now. Um, yeah, I mean, teachers always like to give homeworks and I'm no exception. So you have to find out what, where that NVCC is, right? So we saw that it's a compiler from NVIDIA for compiling your CUDA programs, which are typically named as .cu. So you can find out where that NVCC is. You have to find out what is the CUDA version that you are probably running with, either on Google Colab or on your laptop or somewhere else. Uh, you have to also find out what is mean by device query, right? So device query is a nice utility from NVIDIA SDK, which tells you characteristics of your GPU, right? 
So for example, how many cores does it have? How many uh, streaming multiprocessors, which are essentially groups of cores? How many does it have? Uh, how many threads you can launch uh, maximum? Then uh, how much is the shared memory, et cetera? So all of this information, hardware-centric information, is going to be given by this device query. You can also write that program. It's just that that is already uh, already written for you. So you have to find out where that device query is. It's a useful utility. OK, um, let's move ahead from here. So far, whatever we did was sequential on the GPU. Right? It was 1, 1 with which I was launching the kernel. Now let's get a little more interesting uh, part and let's change it to 1, 32. And as I said, multiplication of these two numbers is going to give us the number of threads. Right? So what are these two numbers? We'll worry about that. For now, understand that I am launching this kernel with 32 threads. After that, I have the rest of the program remains the same. And if I compile and run the program, I get the expected output that hello world gets printed 32 times. All right. So this particular code is in some sense uh, running multiple threads simultaneously. So we will call it as parallel. Uh, but there are definitely more interesting things than running just a printf on a GPU. By the way, many of the functionalities which you can do on the CPU might not be supported on the GPU. For example, you might have these uh, string functions, for example, string length, string cat, str, str, etc. Uh, all of those might not be available on the GPU. Thankfully, printf is available, right? But that is not that is primarily given for your understanding and debugging purposes, not for your hardcore parallel processing. Okay. But uh, for example, you have uh, arrays and so on. So many of the usual other features are available on the GPU and more and more libraries are becoming available. So hopefully things will improve as we go along. Okay, a few concepts uh, in case somebody was wondering what is this thread that this person is talking about and so on. So a process is what we typically execute, right? So a.out, notepad.exe, Chrome, right? So all of these are different processes. Processes are typically textbook definition of that is a program in execution is called as a process. Right? So when you do a taskbar or do a PS, uh, what you see are different processes, different applications. You can call those as different applications. A thread is typically called as a lightweight process, which essentially means that it does not have everything that a process might have, or there are multiple threads associated with a process. And threads might share something which is associated with the process. For example, threads might share the global memory, maybe the RAM that you have. Right? It might share the heap that you might have across different threads of the same process. But individually, threads have their own local variables. So a stack is individual to each thread. Right? You can do recursion inside one thread, which might not affect another thread, and so on. But there will be some global variables which will be common across the two. So if you write from one thread to that global variable the and read from the other thread, maybe you will be able to access it, get the updated value. Okay, So these are called as uh, threads. Typically, these are not visible to us. These are internally implemented. But if you write a multi-threaded program, then you will be able to see those. Um, there are different ways in which threads get implemented. But anyway, I'll keep that aside for you. What is our operating system? Well, whatever we know, usually Windows, uh, Android on your phones, Linux, Mac OS, all of these are operating systems. These operating system is a, a software, but it manages the hardware. Right? So as a user, I don't need to worry about, OK, um, how to give a command, uh, how do you manage different resources, let's say how to give a command to a printer. And then simultaneously, if there are two submissions happening of the 10-page uh, documents, then should those be interleaved or should those be happening one after the other, etc. All of that hardware related aspects, not only printer, but everything, hard disk, um, your uh, flop, uh, floppy disk no longer, but maybe USB drive, CD drive, um, all of your uh, sometimes even power management, all of these RAM, etc. All of these are taken care of by this piece of software, which is called as an operating system, which is a very, very important piece on the machine without that you typically cannot do much with the machine. Hardware is what we typically see, right? So uh, software we don't really see, right? So if I execute a dot out, 
you tell me where that dot out is i might not be able to pinpoint where that is but if you ask me where the ram is i can open the machine and show you where the ram is where the cache is where are the cores etc so those those are typically uh, called as hardware cores are essentially the uh, lowest form of computation units what does that mean that means typically when we say that a thread is running or a process is running that is actually running on a particular core so if i have multiple threads those can either use the same core in time multiplex manner or if you have multiple cores on your machine then multiple threads can execute in parallel right do we have multiple cores on our machines on our laptops yes these days it's difficult to find a machine having a single core right so most of our laptops are quad core or octa core and so on uh, some of the server end machines that you will see have 16 cores and so on so all of these are multiple execution units and therefore you can run multiple threads on them simultaneously uh, if your application is not parallel that is it is not multi threaded then does that mean that i am not utilizing all the cores yes that means that that particular application might not be utilizing all the cores it might just be running on one core and therefore you might want to uh, make your application parallel okay uh i have also mentioned a thread may jump from one core to another what that means is that a thread might execute on one core for some time and then next time it gets scheduled it might go to another uh core and so on okay any questions on these basics all right so i'll move ahead from here also um uh those of you who don't have access to a machine and just have access to some, some notepad and you can scribble either the physical notepad the hard notepad or the soft notepad on your machine uh with whatever we have done so far please see if you are able to write a parallel code that is a cuda code that is a kernel corresponding to this functionality what is this functionality it just says that from 0 to n minus 1 i am going to print the squares of these numbers correct and uh, if you have to write the same code with cuda how will you write it so i'll wait for a few seconds for you guys to try out don't go to your whatsapp try it out on your notepad and in the process if somebody has any question if something is unclear please feel free to ask by the way i see a familiar name in the attendees adarsh kamath hi adarsh hello sir yeah. adarsh uh, did some work with me and uh, uh, as uh, vinit was saying uh, for the national supercomputing mission he has developed a nice uh, interface where you can give uh, Uh, some sort of pseudo code for your uh, algorithm and it will generate a nice back end open mp code um, taking care of the synchronization etc so feel free to visit that page um, yeah 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 it was a nice project but yeah it's very good <laughs> sure. in this uh, code do we have to ensure that uh, the numbers are printed in order uh right so that is the kind of question that i want you to think about right so what your other is asking sequentially we are always going to print 0 1 4 9 like that but is okay. that needed to be guaranteed in the parallel code well you can do that and i'm going to show you the code here which will ensure that that is what is going to happen and then you can also say that well this is running on gpu fair enough but it is running with a single thread and it is guaranteeing that the same output occurs typically uh -huh. these programs are not amenable for parallelization if we have to follow the sequential order if we have to allow parallelism then we have to say that okay i don't care in which order you print these numbers just i want these to be printed right in that case we have a flexibility of parallelization then we can invoke this fun 
with probably n number of threads and then each of them will print them in parallel now these threads are just running on different cores and their speeds might be different and therefore they might print 10149 in arbitrary orders mm -hmm. yeah Yes. So okay. let's try to do that. So uh, some of you, uh, so let's see if you are able to do that. Right? So I have shown you sequential GPU code. Right? Now can you make it yes. parallel code on the GPU without worrying about the ordering amongst the printers? Okay. Uh -huh. Anybody else has any questions? Feel free to ask. All right. So I'm going to show you that code. And that requires you to access that I somehow. Right? And I don't know how to do that because I am going to launch it with 1 and n. But now each thread needs to know which I is passed to it. I can't pass a parameter I here because that I doesn't exist. And note that there is no loop. Here there is just a kernel launch and here there is a single printer. Where is the loop coming into picture? The loop is taken care of by this launch configuration it is called. So 1 comma n means that I'm launching n threads. Each thread is going to execute this function. Now, different threads need to get different values of i, and I don't have a direct way of doing that, but CUDA provides something called as a thread ID that I can use to print it. So since there are going to, this is going to get launched with 100 threads, 0 to 99, thread ID x dot x, as it is called, is going to vary for individual threads from 0 to 99. So I can make use of that to print the value in some arbitrary order. Right? So then 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, etc. All of these are going to get printed in some arbitrary order with this code. And uh, that is going to be a parallel GPU code. Any questions so far? Ah, there is a chat message. Good. Uh, Chaitanya is asking, can we give parameters in fun? Yes, we can provide parameters in fun. Just that whatever parameter we provide is going to go to every thread that is running on the GPU. And therefore, we cannot pass different parameters to different uh, threads. Right? And we will make use of that as we uh, most probably on the next slide or next to next. Thanks for that, uh, Chaitanya. Any other concerns, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, couldn't we use a global count variable and increment it each time a thread uh, prints that does the printer function? Very good. So uh, that's another question from Chaitanya that uh, can we have a global variable which gets incremented by every thread and then that is going to get printed by that thread. right? Um, and then it doesn't matter which thread picks up the value as long as it gets incremented exactly once by each thread that is going to be sufficient. Um, now, while this looks very nice, there is a small catch here. The small catch is that uh, when we are incrementing the variable, we have to understand what all operations we are doing. So let's say that counter value is zero initially, and each thread in parallel is going to read the value of the counter, increment it by one, and setting it back to that counter. For this to happen correctly, the threads should not read exactly the same value. If there are two threads and they are reading the value of zero simultaneously, both of them are incrementing locally and then writing back that value into the counter, then that is going to be a problem because both of them will write the value one. Ideally, it should be two. And both of them will probably print the value zero square or one square, whichever uh, the way it is going to happen. Now, that is not something which we expected. What that means is that if there are two people, who are reading, just reading the value, then there is no problem. But if one of them is reading, one of them is writing, or both of them are writing, then that is going to create a problem. 
Understood? I, I'll repeat this part because this is important. If there are two or more threads which are reading, just reading the value, then there is no problem. Because they'll just read the value, they all will read the same. But even if at least one of them is writing the value and others are either reading or writing, then that can create problems. To avoid these problems, you need to have some sort of coordination amongst the threads. Threads should say that, okay, boss, I'm going now. I'm going to read the value, increment it, and then update it. Only after that, you should come and read the value. This coordination is called as synchronization. Synchronization cannot be arbitrarily guaranteed. And the problem that I mentioned about there are rights involved that causes something called as a data race. This data race is going to be problematic for the correctness of the application. Even in this simple example where we were just incrementing counters, you cannot guarantee that the value is going to be exactly n at the end of all the invocations. It can actually be lower than n. Right? It won't be greater than n, but it will be lower than n because of the problem that I mentioned. So therefore, if we have to implement it that way, then we need synchronization across threads. That's a topic in itself, but I'll mention this, that there is a, uh, in operating systems, we sometimes study this atomic instructions, uh, test and set or atomic CAS. All of those come into picture and those are some things which are provided by CUDA to make sure that when threads are accessing a common shared memory location, accessing meaning beyond reading, at least one of them is a right, then there is a problem, okay? Uh, thanks for that question, Chaitanya. And there is second point. The second point is that when I declare a global variable, where is that variable stored? That variable is going to get stored in the system memory somewhere, right? But we said that CPU is a different processor. GPU is a different processor. And in addition to that, GPUs and CPUs have separate memories. If I declare a global variable that is by default going to get created on the CPU and GPU will not have access to it. In fact, your program will not even compile if we try to do that, right? So that is my next part that I'm going to show uh, quickly, but this is just more like a heads up that we cannot declare a global variable directly and make it accessible in the GPU. And that is where parameter passing is going to come into picture because we are going to allocate some memory on the GPU from the CPU. We are going to allocate some memory on the GPU from the CPU and pass a pointer to that, to this function, to this kernel, right? So uh, as Chaitanya was saying, can we pass parameters? Yes, we'll pass parameters, which are going to be essentially pointers, typically pointers, but you can also pass uh, normal values like five, 10 or integer variable, character variable, et cetera, which gets copied uh, to the GPU. Okay, so we'll do that. We'll do that in the next slide. But is there any other question or no? Okay, so I'm moving ahead. Thanks for those questions. These are interesting. Let's do that for this one, right? So now we are going to uh, see the need for passing parameters. As Chaitanya said, now what I want to do is that instead of printing it, I want to store those values, right? So I'm declaring a variable A, which is an array of N uh, elements. And then in that I'm going to store those. Now I want to parallelize this code. This is a correct C code. There is no problem with that. I want to parallelize it. And we know how to parallelize that. I'm going to launch it with one comma N as the parameters. And then within each thread, I'm going to use thread idx dot X, their multiplication, and that will give me the value. Where do I store? So that is the question that should come to your mind. Where is this A getting? So can I just pass it as a parameter to the kernel? Well, it turns out, as I was mentioning, that the memories are separate and therefore I cannot pass the parameter directly. Right. So this part is what we already know, that global void fun. And to that, I'm going to pass a parameter A. Right? And that A is declared here. And finally, on CPU, I'm going to print those values, right? So that part seems to be okay. This printing is not really part of the original code, but we need to be sure that our code is working. That's why I have added that. So this part seems to be okay. Right? This is like our regular function. But to pass that A, I can't pass it directly. I need to make a copy of that array on the GPU because the CPU and GPU memories are separate by default. 
Okay, these are called as uh, discrete GPUs. There are something called as integrated GPUs where the CPU and memory, CPU and GPU can share the memory, but for now we'll ignore that. So I'm going to launch the kernel as fun with one comma n as parameters in three less than and three greater than, and then da as the parameter. What is da? I have marked it as a pointer to integer, which is essentially uh, uh, an array pointer kind of that I need to somehow allocate on GP. For that, I need to use a variant of like we do malloc. I'm going to use CUDA malloc. CUDA malloc is going to give me some memory in terms of the number of bytes. So whatever is the n into size of int, let's say size of int is four and n is 100. So 400 bytes are going to get allocated on GPU memory and pointer to that is going to be assigned to DA. And since DA needs to change, I need to pass it as with uh, address of DA, right? And then I can pass DA as a parameter. Note that, note that DA is a variable on the CPU. So if you talk about ampersand of DA, ampersand of DA is in the CPU memory, CPU RAM. However, the address which is stored inside DA, which is the value of DA, that address is going to be from the GP. And therefore, when fun tries to access this variable a that is a valid memory location inside the gpu right because that is what i am passing from the cpu okay uh, now this part seems to be okay and accordingly there is uh, 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 accordingly there is update of a so is the code correct is there something remaining now Uh, D A and A need to be yeah, related. No? Correct. Right. So we don't have any correlation between this D A and this A we are printing. That means whatever we have updated on the GPU, that is there on the GPU. We have not yet copied it back to the CPU. So we need to copy back. Right. In case of C, we use mem copy for copying bytes across two pointers, right? Across two arrays. So similarly, CUDA provides CUDA mem copy to copy from DA to A how many bytes and the direction is going to be from device to host. What is a device? Device is typically given the name to the GPU. Host typically means CPU. So device to host means I'm going to copy uh, 400 bytes from GPU memory pointed to by DA to CPU memory pointed to by A. After that, I can I have all those values available on the CPU, and therefore I can just proceed with it as if like our sequential C programs. Any questions on this code? Uh, so, so for for everything, we need to keep doing malloc and then copy this again and again. Like, is it really like worth transferring all this work to the GPU? Like, okay. is it efficient? Yeah, so others question is uh, uh, spot on that. Do we need to really keep creating these copies for between CPU and GPU? Well, most of your processing parallel processing, which is going to happen on the GPU, you can actually uh, allocate only on GPU, do all the processing and only the final result you can get back from the uh, GPU to CPU, right? So that is possible. Uh, is it worth it? Well, this uh, mem copy is a heavy call depending upon the amount of data that you want to transfer across CPU and GPU. Because many times, say, let's say you are running uh, running a DL algorithm, right? So you have all your data stored inside files, the training data or the testing data that you are going to read. That reading is going to be stored inside the CPU memory. All of that data needs to be probably transferred to the GPU memory. Then the training or the testing is going to happen there. And then the final results you are going to get back. Um, isn't this large overhead, the copying between the two devices? Yes, it can be a bottleneck. The hope is that the training and testing times are large enough that it reduces the fraction of time that is spent over the CUDA mem copies. If that is not the case, you better do it on the CPU. If that is not the case, you might get benefit by running directly 
the port either sequentially or in parallel on the CPU. So this CUDA MIM copy can create some problems in terms of the performance. So if you have very large amount of computation, then it is okay. Okay, okay, okay thank you. Sir. No problem. Uh, in addition, I'll also mention, like we have multiple kernel calls, like fun is one kernel call. There might be fun two, fun three, fun four, etc. All of these kernel calls don't need to every time do a CUDA memory. If you have done something, let's say DA was some allocated memory, and I have updated it in fun. I can launch fun two after fun or any time. And this memory is still going to be present there. So think about it like a heap, which we do using malloc. Malloc uh, memory, the heap memory allocated is going to be accessible across multiple functions. Similarly, CUDA malloc memory, until you do CUDA free, that is going to be available uh, across different kernels. So we don't need to copy it again and again. Uh, so that is definitely one advantage. Okay, any other concerns, questions here? Uh, so, yes, I, I had a doubt. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So, uh, when you do this CUDA mem copy, sir, the A and DA, you've initialized these the memory, the sizes of the memory as N, right? Um, mm -hmm. So what happens when these um, the values of these um, memory is not the same on the CPU and the GPU? Like, is there an error that rises or just some data just not copied in? Yeah, so it will. Yeah, this is like a mem copy that we do on the CPU. So if you specify a smaller value, it will copy fewer values. I mean, it will allocate fewer, smaller amount of memory, uh, and you can copy only a few bytes, et cetera. So all of this is possible. So we have to ensure correctness as a program. Okay, so now if like, if A wasn't allotted N, if A was allotted less than N, right. and you try to copy in N bytes to that, like, um, right. isn't that you're trying to overwrite like data right. that you shouldn't access? That is correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, there was some other question also from somebody. So okay. uh, I had a doubt. Yeah. So in, uh, so suppose we need to load uh, deep learning or models from the C from the disk. Can we load it directly into the GPU memory rather than first loading it to CPU and then passing it to GPU memory? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, that is not currently possible. Um, so you have to load the data from disk to uh, CPU memory first. There is some research work which is about GPUFS, which tries which tries to directly access, which allows access from GPU directly to the disk. But currently, GPU does not have. Uh, I mean, in the real practical uh, implementations, we don't have direct access from GPU to disk. So you will have to do it this two way. Okay, sir. Yeah, no problem, Alan. Uh, Chaitanya says, how to modify the code if our array size was greater than number of threads? Good, that's a good question. And we will come to that. Please hold on to it. Uh, sometimes you might have the number of threads might be, OK, I just want to launch 100 threads. But my data size might be 1,000. So I want that each thread should take care of 10 elements at a time. Right? So that is possible. And uh, in that case, one of the ways in which, in fact, whatever we have studied so far, you will be able to do that. You can have a for loop here. Oops. You can have a for loop here, which goes over 10 elements. So essentially, n divided, oh, sorry, uh, n is uh, data size we said is 1000, right? So n is 1000. Number of threads, somehow we will have to figure out how that is. That is going to be our next uh, part, but that is going to be decided by another variable uh, called as block dim dot x. So block dim dot x is going to tell us how many threads are there in a particular block. And using that, we'll be able to divide this n to get the value 10. So for i equal to 0 to 10, I need to access the different elements. What we need to worry about is that now each thread is not going to start from 0. Each thread is going to actually start from 10 into thread ID extra. Right? As long as you do that, then you will be able to do multiple works per thread. Is that OK, Chaitanya? Yes, sir. Good. Any other concerns here? OK, slowly I see that the questions are increasing, and I'm thankful to you for that. OK, so uh, uh, yeah, so this is what we uh, uh, this is what we did. And interestingly, we never 
talked about CDS here. That after this function call is over, after this CUDA mem copy, we didn't specify CDS. So doesn't CPU just go ahead and execute this printf and might print old values, which might be garbage. Well, it turns out uh, that CUDA mem copy is blocking call, right? So CPU, when it executes this uh, fun, it is going to, CPU is going to move ahead and it is going to say that, okay, I'm going to do CUDA mem copy, but CUDA mem copy is similar to the other kernel call, which is going to wait until the previous function is over. Plus from the CPU side, it is not going to allow the CPU to wait. So CUDA mem copy is a combination of, it is going to wait for the kernel to be over, previous kernel to be over, as well as it is not allowing the CPU to go ahead. So there is an inbuilt CDS in some sense for that. And therefore, we don't require CDS here, but that's okay. Even if you add CDS, that is not going to hurt. All right? Okay. So, um, so that is going to allow you to have uh, memory copied across the two devices. Uh, so let's come to what we had in uh, was suggested earlier that can we have a global variable, which I can just uh, access inside. Well, we talked in the, in the context of a counter, but that can also be talked about, let's say in terms of a global memory, right? So that is a constant cat star here because that memory is not changing. And I just launch it with 32 threads, right? It turns out that this code doesn't even compile. So in VCC gives an error that MSG is undefined in the device code, device is GPU. And because MSG is defined on the CPU memory, therefore it is not accessible on the GPU. Not always the compiler is able to figure out that the memory is on the CPU or GPU because sometimes there might be pointers which it is not able to figure out. So it might just give a warning, but it is the onus is on the programmer to figure out uh, whether we are accessing the right memory from the right device. The compiler is only going to help as much as possible. Okay. So, yeah, so the takeaway here is that the CPU and GPU memories are separate for discrete GPUs. So let me uh, spend one minute talking about this uh, picture where we have the CPU, there is a GPU. These are two separate devices. There is a DRAM in both of them, dynamic RAM. And the CPU and GPU are usually connected by an interconnect called as a PCI Express bus, uh, which is typically uh, an IO bus on which you perform all the CUDA mem copies essentially happen. And as I have shown two ways, you can copy memory from any device to any other device, right? That is from CPU to GPU. Um, so yeah, so they have separate RAMs, the two devices, a variable in CPU memory cannot be accessed directly in the GPU kernel. There are exceptions to this, but this is what is probably best to remember at this stage. Uh, and therefore, it becomes an onus on, on the programmer to maintain copies of the variables and also to keep them in sync. Okay. So that becomes a uh, little complicated for the, for the programmers. I contrast it with OpenMP uh, where you don't have to really worry about these copies because all the threads are essentially sharing the uh, RAM. So shared memory systems this is going to be not a problem, whereas these, uh, in some sense, distributed system is going to always have this issue of maintaining copies as well as maintaining them in sync. All right. So I'm going to just show a CUDA uh, overall flow again pictorially, which we all have studied, but just to make sure that we all are in sync. So there is a CPU, there is a GPU, there is a disk. From the disk, I'm going to load the data as step number one. That is going to get loaded in CPU memory. I'm going to transfer that data from CPU to GPU, maybe after some pre-processing and so on. That is CUDA mem copy. On GPU, I'm going to launch some kernel, one or more kernels, which are going to execute in parallel. Uh, and I get the results. The results I copy back from GPU memory to CPU memory as step four. And then I, as step five, I continue using those results on the CPU, either using a single thread or I can as well do multi-threaded uh, processing on the CPU. And that processing might actually involve further copying the data back to the GPU, maybe next set of data, and then further uh, repeating this particular loop. Okay. Any questions on this high level flow or anything we have covered so far? Any questions?
okay so i am going to give you a break not now but maybe around 6:15 to 6:30 whenever there is a logical break possible around that time we'll uh, disperse for 5 minutes and then we'll come back uh, but for now we'll go ahead from here okay so uh, the loading of data into cpu memory needs to be done either using let's say file reading or you can generate random data using uh, rand function uh, copying from cpu to gpu happens with cuda mem copy with the last parameter being cuda mem copy host to device that is from cpu to gpu then we launch the kernel copying results back is again cuda mem copy from device to host and then using results on the cpu okay uh, and this as uh, uh, adarsh was asking that do we need to really maintain two copies well yes and therefore you will see in many codes see a gpu codes cuda codes you will see that okay there is in star cpu array and then gpu array cpu matrix gpu matrix cpu graph gpu graph right so these are likely to be there in many of the codes and uh, uh, therefore you will see this and and now you know the reason why that happens okay so let's um, uh, come to a specific code um, at this stage i am going to leave it to you to figure out who tells me what is going to be the output of this program first okay i'll explain a little bit so there is a cpu array then there is a gpu array gpu array cannot be declared using the array brackets because i don't know how many elements to declare it with that is one the second one is even if you know this memory is not going to be available on the we don't want it to be on the cpu we want it to be allocated on the gpu that must be allocated using cuda malloc and therefore i have to declare it as a pointer so i declare that pointer uh, and i do a, a malloc then i do a mem copy from cpu to gpu then i launch a kernel then there is a cds and then i get the mem again this uh, cds is unnecessary because of cuda mem copy and then from device i get the result back onto the cpu and then i print that cpu you have to tell me what is the output of this code and in the process if there are any questions feel free to ask Okay, Chetan is the first one to find out the correct answer. Almost the correct answer, right? So it is just going to increment all these elements, right? So what we are doing here is plus plus arr of id, right? Um, this length is much smaller. compared to the number of threads i am going to launch so some threads should not access array out of bounds so therefore that check exists here but otherwise it's just going to increment the value so this becomes h e l l o and so on so this slash x1 is the hexadecimal slash x1 f is the hexadecimal value for maybe 31 because that is a non printable character i had to give it that way because 32 becomes space Right, and so on right that uh, hyphen might be the previous character of exclamation mark and so on okay great thanks a lot chaitanya um, and if you did not get the answer uh, don't lose heart there is more in store for you okay so we'll move ahead from uh, from here uh, let's write a cuda program to initialize an array of size 32 to all zeros in parallel right so please write that if somebody wants to type the answer uh, type the full code feel free to do that either way so
okay so i hope you are able to uh, scribble something um this is typically going to require you to write the kernel which is going to get launched with 1 comma 32 and then inside that i'm going to write uh, i need to have cuda malloc array which is being passed as a parameter like da we have passed that da of thread idx dot x equal to 0 is what the main statement inside the kernel should be let's say that we have written this code down right now i want this to be changed to 1024 right so the way i am going to do it is simple i had 1 comma 32 as the launch configuration i am going to change it to 1 comma 1024 and if i compile and run the code i'll see that it actually works now what i do is that i am going to add create another kernel that is going to add i to arr array of i so which means that whatever were the zero values those are going to get now modified to i what is that i well you can say that thread idx dot x is the uh, i value so that i can do as another kernel right so that can be your practice which you can do maybe later now i want you to change the array size to 8000 so obviously i am going to say 1 comma 8000 and then when i try to compile it it doesn't compile it gives me an error that the maximum uh limit is actually 1024 and you can't really increase it beyond that to 8000 right but then we have said that the multiplication of these two numbers is going to give us the total number of threads so can i now use that first number to increase the number of threads to 8000 and that is definitely going to be possible so i can launch the kernel with 8 comma 1000 1000 comma 8 40 comma uh, 40 comma 200 any of these combinations or many of these combinations are going to actually work out right? and that is what i am going to uh, show you now this you can try as a homework exercise i'll skip this and once i have those two parameters i need to understand how the threads are organized right so i'll show you how the code will look like uh maybe in a different uh, uh example but uh for this to understand uh and don't give too much importance to this thread organization what you need to understand is that uh a thread has three dimensions what we have used so far is only one dimension dot x but there are dot y and dot z also this can be very useful especially for some of the graphics related processing or geometry related processing which was actually the main motivation for the graphics processes right which are precursors to graphics processing um uh, okay so we have those and then as far as multiple threads are concerned those are actually grouped together so why do we need to group those together there are multiple reasons but think about it this way that you have a very large number of students let's say in campus in itk campus right so all of those cannot be staying in one hostel you have to push those or group those into different hostels and then uh, each hostel will individually take care of them similarly if all of you are going to let's say some picnic right uh, when the physical world really comes back so all of you are going for a picnic in multiple buses right so you can't have a very large bus which accommodates all of you it becomes easier to manage if you have multiple such buses even if you are going by a train there are multiple boxes in which you are going to be sitting so these boxes or these multiple these different buses are actually called as blocks in the context of cuda or thread blocks which are groups of threads maximum limit of a thread block is 1024 and what that second parameter we have been providing to the launch configuration 1 comma 32 that 32 is the block size right that means how many students you can accommodate inside a bus right? so that is what it means and then the first parameter is going to be how many buses you have that is how many thread blocks you have and the total number of students therefore becomes a multiplication of these two essentially the number of threads is decided by number of blocks multiplied by now a block size so the block uh, size is decided by block dim dot x that is the number of threads in x direction uh, y as well as z and again you don't have to worry too much about this part what you need to do what you need to understand is that i am going to show you on the next slide what you require but essentially you require three things which i have uh boxed out 
okay these are the three things that you essentially require you can ignore most of the others for our discussion um the number of blocks is also defined something called as a grid which means that the whole journey is decided by how many blocks are there so that is decided by the number of blocks in x dimension y dimension and z dimension so actually you can have a very large launch configuration and therefore people say that you can launch millions of threads simultaneously on the gpu well that is true that is you can launch a kernel with million threads uh, that is not always going to be beneficial first of all second uh, not all of them are actually running at the same time how many threads can run simultaneously on a gpu so what is going to decide how many threads can run simultaneously okay so a thread is running on some piece of hardware what was that some smallest unit of computation or execution the core core and therefore the number of cores on your gpu right is going to decide how many threads can be simultaneously active right so uh, on your cpus you might have 4 8 16 32 32 cores on a gpu you can actually have a few thousand cores and therefore a few thousand threads can be simultaneously active on the gpu okay? not always they are active but it's possible there are other constraints because of memory and so on and uh, something called as warp based execution but for now you can assume that those many that is the maximum parallelism you can get uh, and your device query is going to tell you how many cores are there on your gpu okay all right so let's focus on these three parts block idx.x block dim.x and thread idx.x these three are going to be sufficient for most of not only our discussion but most of the course that you write what is thread idx.x that is a student's id inside the bus inside the bus all students are going to be numbered as 0 to something whatever is the block size whatever is the bus size let's say 1024 that means 0 to 1023 are going to be the uh, local ids of students block idx.x is the bus number buses are also numbered as 0 1 2 3 4 whatever is the number of buses that uh, number of buses can be large block dim.x is that 1024 that is the second parameter of the launch configuration what is the size of the bus right i'll repeat this size of the bus is block dim.x local id of a student inside a bus is thread idx.x 02 block dim.x minus 1 okay. and then block idx.x is the bus number that means if i have to uniquely identify a student how will i find that out using these three values if i have to uniquely identify a student that is give a unique id from 0 to the number of students minus 1 what is the calculation that i need to do you can start from the block id and then add on the thread id mm, okay so block id is 1 thread id is 0 i mean the student id is oh 0. right uh, okay <laughs> you have to multiply block dim as well then okay so bus number into size of the bus is going to take me to one offset within that the number of students within that are going to tell me give unique ids to that right so if the first bus has 1024 students then i'm going to give bus number 0 02 1023 are the student unique ids the second bus which has bus number 1 will have 1 into 1024 plus 0 to 1023 and therefore it will have 1024 to 2047 as the ids of the second set of students and so on and therefore the calculation becomes block id dot x block idx dot x into block dim dot x plus thread idx dot x that is going to give me a unique id for us for a particular thread right so that is what i am going to show here in one dimension that is 
you can use the same for dot y dot z 2d 3d etc but one dimension suffices for most of the codes i mean whatever you are able to do with two and three dimensions you can do with one dimension it's only for convenience sake that those dot y and dot z exist in cuda there is no performance penalty whether you use single dimension or multiple dimensions okay so i have n into m and that is going to be deciding the launch configuration right uh, in main i am going to create a matrix uh, and as you can see two element two variables of type matrix unsigned star so one is on the cpu sorry uh, this one is on the gpu and this one is on the cpu h is for the host i am going to allocate the gpu matrix with n into m number of elements and h matrix using cpu malloc right this is our usual malloc after this i need to uh, initialize the variables now that initialization i can do directly inside d kernel where i am going to pass two parameters n comma m where these are small values but you can as well increase these values and the code will still work to that i am going to pass pointer to the gpu memory array which is matrix once i have done that then i am going to copy this matrix from matrix to h matrix right so that requires cuda mem copy from matrix to h matrix number of elements n into m and from device to host that is from gpu to cpu and then i am just going to print it how should the code be written such that i want to initialize the matrix to unique ids right so whatever we have discussed about the unique id of a student inside a bus that you have to apply now to create this kernel can somebody quickly write that kernel okay assuming that some of you have tried the kernel will look something like this where i find the unique id as we discussed on the previous slide bus number into size of each bus plus unique id of a student inside the bus okay. i mean not unique id id of the student inside the bus that is going to give me a unique id across 0 to 29 because i am launching the kernel with n comma m so block idx dot x goes from 0 to n minus 1 block dim dot x is block dim dot x is equal to n uh, it should be equal to m is the block dimension and the thread idx dot x ranges from 0 to n uh, m minus 1 right so 0 to 5 all right so uh, just a quick check if i want the launch configuration to be 2 comma x what will be the value of x so 15 15 right so n into m by 2 and that multiplied by 2 should give me nm because i want this nm number of threads to be launched to fill up the matrix because the matrix size is n into m right um, and we don't need to change this code the id is still going to be computed correctly whether you use m comma n or 2 comma mn by 2 or 3 comma mn by 3 etc whatever you use or even 1 comma mn or mn comma 1 irrespective of that your kernel code will still remain the same and it will still work right because uh, it is going to still give you a 0 to 29 as unique ids okay all right so uh, yeah one takeaway which i want to convey here is that you can perform multi dimensional processing this mn uh, that we have allocated actually is a two dimensional array i mean it we have allocated as single dimensional but you want to access it as two dimensional array but that can be done using single dimensional arithmetic and on gpu you are, you can do it within using a single dimension uh, 
dot x values only right we don't have to worry about dot y dot z etc okay so let's come to the other part of what uh, was asked by chaitanya some time back that if you have a larger array size than the number of threads what happens um well one possibility is that as we mentioned one thread can perform multiple uh, uh, uh process multiple elements but another way is that maybe i can launch those many threads if i have enough number of threads to be launched then i can possibly do this right so when you have a large amount of data uh, you don't have to worry about the block size that is the bus size that is that you can always set to a fixed value i am setting it to the maximum possible in the current gpus 1024 but uh, that is not always the best uh, from performance perspective sometimes you might want to reduce it to let's say 768 or 512 or even sometimes to 56 to reduce the size of the block that is you make the buses smaller but increase the number of buses that might give you better performance that is also possible so how do i do that well in this case i am going to use command line arguments right so arg c arg v is what we know of these uh, i am going to read that uh, n the size of the data from the user as command line argument then i am going to allocate a vector of that size on the gpu and on the cpu using cuda malloc and malloc respectively after that i am going to launch the kernel to initialize the uh, yeah to initialize the vector for that i need to know how many blocks are required so the blocks are going to be decided by what is the size of the data which is n divided by block size is going to give me the number of blocks that are required the number of buses that are required then i launch the kernel using n blocks and block size passing vector as a parameter in which i do some processing right so again i am going to do uh, some processing with respect to vector of Uh, id right so id is the unique id and that uh, vector of id equal to something right and finally i copy it back from device to host from vector to h vector and i process it further where in this case i am just printing it right so the code for the kernel essentially is compute the unique id and then vector of id equal to it is that okay any questions on this code okay so if there are no questions then i am going to ask you some question on this code so there are actually two issues with this code right and we are going to take a break of 5 minutes at 625 i am going to come back and ask you what are the two issues with this code okay so we'll take a break for 5 minutes
Okay, we have uh, some response from Rahul. We'll wait for two more minutes. Yeah, in case somebody wants to ask any questions, meanwhile, feel free to ask. I'm here. Chetan is asking, can we assign a variable amount of blocks? In example, so far only constants were used. Yes, it is all right to assign uh, both the values to be arbitrary uh, expressions, not a problem. Actually, the Second issue you can find out from your C knowledge also. In fact, to give you some hint, I'm going to point out the places where the issues are. The first one is always uh, already pointed out by Rahul that uh, there should be a check about this. Why? Because think about this, that you are launching, let's say your N that you are passing as a parameter is 1025. To take an extreme example, 1025. How many, uh, I mean, that is the size of the problem, right? N is the size of the problem. So how many blocks are going to be required? We'll require two blocks, 1024 plus another block. So how many threads are going to get launched? It is going to be two into 1024. And that means that you actually have 2048 threads working on it, but the size of the array is actually only 1025. And therefore, you need to have a check here that the ID should be less than the vector size. So that is correct. Raul's uh, observation is correct, that there should be a check. Uh, OK, Chaitanya says the user might give a negative n from command line. Yes, that is another problem, which I did not think about, I must say. Uh, yes, that could be another uh, problem, which we uh, did not anticipate. Uh, yeah, that can cause issues. Um, in fact, many of the things will stop working because of that, because the CUDA malloc, malloc, etc., all of that will stop working. Yes, I didn't think about that. Is there any other uh, thought? Okay, so the other problem here is that that n upon block size right so we would like to seal it the seal function nicely does that that whatever number you give that is going to seal it to the next integer so that part seems to be okay but note that n and block size both are integers and if that is the case that integer truncation is already going to happen before even seal comes into picture and therefore if i give 1024 sorry 1025 divided by block size it is going to give me the value 1 that is going to get converted to a float 1.0 on which seal is going to perform, which will give you the value 1. And therefore, this is going to give us a wrong value for 1025. Right? So you will just process only, you will not process the last block of threads. Right? So that's possible. So how do we fix that? Well, the first one we is array access out, out of bounds, bounds, and this one requires floating point division. Both can be easily fixed. We check this. And we add a uh, uh, type cast here, which will take care of uh, the correct division. OK, so you will see that this particular code is very often uh, seen in the kernels. And that's because of uh, this multiplication of these two values. OK, any questions so far?
All right. So I'm going to move ahead from here. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, interrupt or use the chat. I'm checking the chat uh, regularly. Okay. One another problem which uh, one can think about is that you read several points from the input. It could be file input. It could be user input. And for each pair of points, that is uh, n square combination order n square combinations, we compute the Euclidean distance using SQRT function. Assume that SQRT is available on the GPU. And this one now can nicely be done in parallel. But note that how much parallelism you extract is also important. One thing is you have n points. So you might say that, OK, I'm going to do, uh, do it with n threads. Another way is that, well, this computation can actually use order n square, that is n into n minus 1 by 2 number of uh, threads and perform compute all these order n square distances in parallel because this is a read only operation and each one that you are writing to the uh, uh, output array that is going to be all completely different memory locations therefore you can actually improve parallelism in this case the final part is that printing the maximum distance now how do you do that you are given n square element order n square elements and you want to compute a maximum distance now, this seems to be a totally sequential process, right? Anybody has any thoughts on how to improve upon this sequentiality of, you are given n numbers and you want to find out what is the maximum number in this array. Can this be done in parallel? Any thoughts? Okay. I didn't see any answers, but I'll give you a hint. Uh, let's say that you have these different buses where you are going to, let's say you are going to Mahabalipur, right, in these buses. I'm asking you, right, so who is the person having the maximum amount of money? Right? That is in some sense finding the max across all the students who are going to Mahabalipur. Now, you guys are in the buses and you are allowed to communicate with each other. I mean, across buses also, how will you minimize the communication? And that should give you some hint on what, how you will compute the max. So please think about it. I'll leave it here. Okay, so let's move ahead. So there are two hardware configurations of GPUs which I'm showing here. One is P100, another is V100. You might have heard these terms or even if you have not heard, that's okay. This is from the Pascal family of uh, GPU processors, and this is from the Volta, that's why this V uh, family. And uh, Volta is the newer one. So the number of, there is something called as streaming multiprocessors, that is that SM and X is for the, I think the extended family. Earlier this used to be called as SM, now it is called as SMX. So that has increased the number of cores, as I was saying, can be a few thousands, it can be, more than 5,000 for V100. Uh, you can perform tensor computations. The floating point operations per second can be really large at 7.5 teraflops from one GPU, right? So one GPU is of the size of double the your hand, right? So that is the size of your GPU. And that can offer you this high performance. This is really large. Um, for, a, for a comparison, your uh, laptop might be capable of performing one teraflop uh, operations right? at the peak performance. So this is a really powerful uh, piece of hardware that has been devised uh, by not only NVIDIA, but there are other companies who are devising it. But the amount of RAM that you might have might turn out to be a little small compared to a CPU memory. On CPUs, we have several hundreds of GBs of RAM also possible. Uh, you can have a uh, uh, even 1000 GB of RAM is not uncommon. But uh, the GPU memories are that will limit it. And uh, although that limits the amount of data that you can hold, this data is also sufficiently large. And that's why we keep uh, seeing multiple usages of GPUs in all kinds of different applications. Right? They are no longer uh, used only in data parallel applications, but 
any kind of application as long as you have large amount of data with a good chance you'll be able to find some use of gps okay uh, and then one thing which i didn't mention is about this compute capability compute capability essentially tells you what are the features that are embedded into this particular gpu so when we say that this particular gpu is of this compute capability that means it supports certain things for example 6.0 compute capability might not support tensor computation but 7.0 or 7.5 uh, might support uh, uh, tensor computations and like that. Um, I'm just going to show you a picture of, not picture, but a tabular arrangement of what are the compute capabilities of different and their names, right? So I mentioned already two names, Pascal and Volta, but there are others which you might have heard earlier. So that major number of compute capability X dot Y, that major number X defines the architecture, right? So when it was one, it used to be called as Tesla family of GPUs. Uh, major number two is for me. Uh, does anybody know what three is? Or anybody wants to guess that is also okay. Okay. Three is Kepler, uh, four is Maxwell. Uh, sorry, there is no four, uh, I think for some reason, and there is five is Maxwell. The sixth one is Pascal, which we saw P100, and then the seventh one was Volta, uh, which gets used at multiple places currently. But then uh, NVIDIA has already moved ahead, and uh, you might have seen the next one, uh, at least heard of next one somewhere. Right. So, 81 is essentially Turing uh, compute uh, architecture. Ninth one is Ampere. So, if you have heard about A100 architecture, uh, A100 GPUs, that is the Ampere uh, architecture. But uh, there are more planned in future, and those are named after uh, uh, some of the uh, females whom we know of. So, first one is related to the Loveless, Ada Loveless. Who is supposed to be the first programmer, and the eleventh one is uh, from the uh, Grace Hopper. Right. All right. So uh, these are the currently planned compute capabilities. Overall, uh, just as a summary before I uh, move ahead uh, with something interesting related to computation, is uh, the full form is compute unified device architecture. It consists of both hardware and software parts. Uh, you can execute. The programs written in sorry, written in C, C++, Fortran, OpenCL, and some other languages uh, on GPUs. CUDA program uh, calls something called as kernel. Kernel executes parallel threads. The programmer or the compiler needs to organize these threads in the form of blocks and grids. That's the buses and multiple blocks forms the grid. Maybe a school, you can say. The GPU instantiates a kernel program, that is, it launch, uh, finally runs the program. Uh, a thread within a thread block, right? So, thread block we called as a bus, right? Within a thread, uh, sorry, within a thread block, there are threads. It executes instance of the kernel, that is, each thread is executing whatever code we have written in that underscore underscore global underscore underscore function. It has a thread ID. Uh, Within a thread block is thread ID x dot x. Within a grid is essentially we'll have to compute. We computed it using the multiplication plus uh, addition. It has a program counter, which means what is the next instruction to execute. It has a set of registers per thread, some private memory. It can use some input and output results, right? So these out input and output results are not related to a disk, but these are related to uh, its own uh, some sort of uh, memory or even the parameters which get passed from a uh, uh, CPU. A thread block is essentially a set of concurrently executing threads. All the thread blocks are running on one streaming multiprocessor. Sorry, all the threads of a thread block are running on one streaming multiprocessor. Well, streaming multiprocessor was the hardware unit on which multiple thread blocks can execute. And uh, one thread block always is residing on one particular streaming multipress. And the advantage of coordination across these uh, different blocks, that is threads within a block, is that uh, they have fast barrier synchronization amongst themselves. They all can say, okay, 
execute all these instructions then all of them wait at this particular place instruction and until all of you have reached this place we can none of us is going to execute the next instruction right think about it this way that all of you are going to mahabalipuram right you all decide that okay we are going to meet at the beach first right and until everybody has reached the beach of uh, nit ke surat ka we are not going to move ahead from there right so that is called as a barrier in addition there is some fast memory is uh, like a cache which is provided for all the threads within a thread block so they can actually coordinate with each other very fast uh, a grid is essentially a school of multiple thread blocks right it has access to a global memory this global memory is essentially ram on the gpu uh this is private memory space so that is okay uh and then this is the shared memory that i was talking about using which you can coordinate amongst the threads within a thread block all right any questions on this summary otherwise we'll look at one specific application and we'll make things a little more interesting okay so one usual application that we see in data parallel the uh, process is matrix multiplication right so in this case i am going to multiply the matrix with itself and therefore this becomes matrix query uh, the code sequential code to do that is uh, uh, shown like this where we have uh, a matrix and another matrix as a result and i am also specifying the matrix size uh, it usually has these three loops for i for j for k and then we know that uh, how to take care of that so i j, result of i j is uh, plus equal to uh, let's say a of i k into b of k j right so that is our usual uh, uh, computation that we do using uh, a and b matrices so in this case a and b are the same and since i am not using two dimensional arrays the reason being that i want to do it on parallel on the gpu also where we can pass only a single i mean not that we cannot pass double pointers but the uh, single pointer is the one that is going to essentially you will have to access two dimensional array using a single dimensional uh, pointer and therefore we would like to specify this also on the cpu in that manner so that it becomes easier for us to compare now this is a very heavy operation right as uh, matrix size increases quickly uh, as matrix size increases the overall time to compute this Uh, matrix querying also increases very rapidly because this is n cube computation so this is order n cube operation okay uh, when i set the matrix size to 64 on my machine and i ran it on my cpu right to which the gpu was attached it took 1.527 milliseconds for n equal to 64 matrix size equal to 64 so how did i find this out well i could time only invocation of this function but i should not do that only once i run it a few number of times let's say x number of times whatever is the total time divided by x gives me the average time for square cpu execution right so that is how we should be doing it that is what i did and i got this what i did was okay now i have very nice parallel computation in this let me parallelize this on the gpu so that is what i tried to do Uh, how will that look like so the version one looks like this the way i'm going to call it is let's uh, call the function name as the kernel name as square i'm going to launch it with n threads where n is essentially the matrix size uh, i pass the matrix i also pass the result pointer and i pass n as the three parameters the kernel code looks very similar very similar except that there is no i loop because that i loop i can now convert into multiple threads so different threads take different values of i that i is going to essentially be replaced by this id so wherever i had i that becomes id the rest of the code remains the same so i have these inner two for loops here which are going to uh, take care of the j and k loops right? any questions on this particular code how did i parallelize this is this correct is are there any issues with this okay so this for n equal to 64 this suffices and this seems to give a correct uh, result also 
and therefore i am happy with this that okay i have my parallel code which i can run on the gpu so i ran it again i did some profiling to figure out exactly how much time was required the original time recall was 1.5 milliseconds and now i required 6.39 milliseconds after parallelization of the i uh, that's a little bit of disappointment you will suggest you will see uh, so any suggestions why that happened okay so when i ran it on the cpu there was nothing like copying the matrix across the two devices and so on whereas in case of gpu i need to do that i need to copy the matrix to the cpu to, uh, from cpu to gpu and get the result back from gpu to cpu so that uh, time needs to be added for fair comparison between cpu and gpu but i was a little unfair because i was biased towards gpu so I, what i did was i didn't copy the cuda mem copy time i just copied the kernel time and that also gave me actually that actually gave me 6.3 milliseconds if i had added cuda mem copy that would have taken more time so this happens because um, cpu is much faster one core of a cpu is typically three times faster than one core of the gpu uh, so if you uh, recall you might say that it is 2.4 gigahertz 2.5 gigahertz 3 gigahertz etc your cpu uh, intel core right whereas the gpu core might be 0.7 gigahertz 0.8 gigahertz and so on and therefore uh, it's not always the case that your code will always run better on the gpu even in parallel even if there is parallelism you need to have enough first of all parallelism second one you need to have enough execution time to see the benefits of that parallelism this was not that high so what i did was okay i can't uh, change my gpu but maybe can i increase the parallelism in some way so what i did was mm, there seems to be another loop j let me try to parallelize that and let me call that as version 2 so in version 2 i am going to parallelize both the loops i and g and let's see if that gives any benefits for that i need to change the launch con launch configuration because i am going to launch it with n square threads now instead of n threads and that gives me some advantage because i have better parallelism opportunity here right can i do it as 1 comma n into n well in this case that is not possible because n into n for n equal to 64 is going to go beyond 1024 okay so i need to do n comma n or something like n square divided by 1024 comma 102 right? so that is okay now i have two uh, uh, issues one is how do i find out ii and another is how do i find out jj finding out ii uh, was easy earlier when there were only n threads but now I have n square threads. So the unique ID is not going to directly help us. Right? But the way it can be done is using such a computation, which again is common across multiple uh, uh, places, multiple programs, where I can take a division and a mod, and that is going to give me the i and jj values. Right? So if you look at, let's say, the unique ID of a student, that is the global ID of a student, how do I find out which bus the person is in and what is the local ID of that uh, particular student? So if all the buses are of the same size, I can say unique ID divided by the size of the bus is going to give me the bus ID. And the unique ID mod bus size is going to give me the local ID of that student inside the bus. And that is precisely what we are doing here with I and JJ. The KK loop remains the same. And the computation continues to have the same values using i and jj and kk with this hard work do i get any benefit well it turns out that i do get some benefits right? so this second version uh, completes in 0.1 milliseconds so this is where the profiling of the code is coming into picture finally the parallelization is for performance so we need to know how much benefit we are getting out of this right? so that requires you to check certain parts of the code for different uh, times how much time is being required etc there is a profiler called nsight from nvidia 
uh, using which you can get this information kind of free. It is going to run your code and you can uh, get which parts of the code are taking how much time, etc. So I strongly recommend people to use that if you are serious into uh, GPU programming. All right, any questions so far? Uh, yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, so since you're creating exactly n square threads here, you're doing n into n. Can't you just take ii as the, I guess, the block ID and jj as a thread ID directly? Instead of doing this computation of uh, dividing by matrix size. Oh, I see. So you are saying that can I take the block ID as uh, ii and the uh, thread ID x dot x as the... Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, as jj. Yes, you yeah. are right. That is going to be exactly same uh, yeah. uh, values. Yes, you are right. That can be. The reason why I showed it in this manner is uh, also because, uh, although I'm not showing it here, we are not discussing it here, but such a computation you might require in multiple places where uh, you might have arbitrary number of threads. In this case, we were lucky that both were NN, so it was all working out very nicely. So this observation by uh, Nishant is correct that uh, you can just use block idx dot x and thread idx dot x as i and jj values, and that will give you, that is correct. In general, when you have these two as different values, you might require such a computation. So uh, uh, just keep a track of this. Good. Any other uh, suggestions? OK. So um, is this going to be beneficial, even if I add CUDA mem copy calls into it? Uh, it turns out that it can be a little more beneficial compared to CPU. And if you want more benefits from the CPU, then you will have to increase the size of N. And that uh, actually reduce, that actually increases the gap between the CPU performance and the GPU performance, despite adding the CUDA mem copy times to the kernel time. Right? So uh, as the data sizes grow, the GPU can give you, or in general, parallel processing can give you more and more benefits. Uh, if you interchange i and jj, well, you can, the code will still work. Does that give any benefits? It can uh, give you some benefits, uh, which I'll probably skip, but there is a reason why, uh, well, in this case, yeah. So this jj is the, are the values which are running faster, right? So the uh, i into matrix size is running slower. Uh, for the original loop, and this one is running faster. Uh, so that has some advantage in terms of caching. But in this case, since all of these are going to be running in parallel for different values of i and jj, this is not going to hurt you in performance. Uh, overall hierarchy of the computation, since we talked about a few uh, aspects, I wanted to pictorially show how the overall computation hierarchy looks like. At the bottommost layer is a single thread. Um, a group of threads which are executing in single single instruction multiple data format or SIMD format, which means that they all are executing exactly the same instruction, just that they are operating on different data items. For example, all of them are executing add instruction or all of them are executing a store instruction, uh, just that they are storing to different values, different uh, memories. So that is called as a war. A group of 32 threads forms a war. Right, on the current GPUs. Multiple such warps together forms a thread block. So we said that a typical size of a thread block in terms of number of threads is 1024, which means that 32 warps can form a thread block. Uh, you can have uh, fewer warps also inside a thread block. This is a typical size or maximum size. Multiple blocks might get assigned to a streaming multiprocessor. And a streaming multiprocessor uh, can be running tens of thousands of threads at uh, any point in time, but not simultaneously in a time multiplex manner. A particular GPU is composed of multiple streaming multiprocessors, uh, maybe 16 or 20 uh, and so on. And therefore a GPU can actually run hundreds of thousands of threads or even millions of threads uh, in a time multiplex manner. Right? So this forms the overall computation hierarchy on the GPU. Um, any questions on any of these parts? I'll bore you till 7.30. Uh, 
Um, so those of you who have interest can stay back till 7:30. Beyond that, I myself is going to get I'm going to get tired. So I'll uh, spare you of that at 7:30. Okay. So meanwhile, I'll discuss a few things. Right. So one question that can come up is what is this warp? And the best way to understand this warp is uh, thinking about Ravana, right, from our uh, 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 Ramayana, uh, where all of these heads they um, they all can let's say perform the same processing simultaneously but on different data items for example uh, if you allow them to watch 10 different movies they can do that right so different heads can watch 10 different movies in parallel right? um, yeah let's not get into the physics or biology part of it but uh, yeah so they can watch 10 movies in parallel or they can read 10 books in parallel however if some threads want to let's say go to a hostel uh, some thread wants to go to a movie hall some thread wants to go to for uh, let's say a mall all of these might not be possible right so they all have to execute exactly the same instruction of watching movie or reading a book and so on of course some of them can read a book and some of them can watch a movie that is okay but they can't be at two different places so that is what is essentially a simd execution that all of them have to execute exactly the same instruction that is add instruction store instruction as i was talking about or any other instruction it can't be the case that some threads want to execute add instruction some other threads want to execute sub instruction that can't be executing in parallel right but we do have codes where such a processing is possible Right? So if I launch a kernel with 32 threads, that is going to form a war. And if I have, if I write a code that if ID less than 10, execute S1, else execute S2. This code I can execute. Right? This is a valid C code. This is a valid CUDA code. I'll repeat that code. Right? We have this ID equal to thread ID x dot x, and the launch configuration is 1 comma 32. So it is going to have a single warp and all the threads must execute in SIMD fashion. Single instruction, multiple data fetch. If I write the code, if thread ID x dot x less than 10, execute some instruction S1, else execute some instruction S2. How will this happen? Right? It turns out that GPUs are not capable of running these two in parallel. So for warp threads, it has to be executed in SIMD fashion. And that means that when the threads 0 to 9 are executing S1, the other threads have to close their eyes. That is, they can't execute any. Right? So when you are reading, when you are going to a shopping mall, the other threads which want to go to a hostel, they have to close their eyes. They can't do anything. And when the other way around happens, the first set of threads have to close their eyes. That is. They execute a no-op or they are in some sense masked from execution. Right? So that is uh, how the warp execution happens and we'll see some of that uh, soon. Okay. Um, warp threads are fully synchronized. What that means is that after every instruction is executed, there is a barrier in some sense. Right? This is not exact uh, actual barrier which exists. But after every instruction, so they execute in lockstep. Lockstep meaning, uh, think about it like an army. Right? So they execute first leg, then the second leg, and then the third leg, all of them together. In a similar manner, the instructions get executed by these 32 threads of a warp in lockstep manner. They all execute add. Then they, all of them have to finish add before any thread in the warp execute the next instruction. Right? So that is a lockstep execution or fully synchronized. Uh, memory coalescing is something related to the memory related optimization, which I will skip for now, but that is something which uh, uh, needs to be uh, definitely taken care of we, if you want to write a, an efficient GPU program. Right? It has a uh, very close connection with warps. Right? One, one uh, mistake that sometimes people do as a misconception is that all the threads in the GPU execute the same instruction at the same time right so this is a misconception right that doesn't happen lockstep execution is true only for the 32 threads of the warp across warps you can execute any arbitrary instructions okay 
all right so let's then add that condition right that i was talking about so if my id mod 2 that is i am an odd number thread then i am going to execute some instruction otherwise i am going to execute some other instruction right and then there is a common instruction across this how is the execution going to happen i am going to show you that by numbering these as s0 s1 s2 s3 as four statements so initially and we'll just for the sake because my screen size is limited i'm going to take uh, warp size as 8 rather than 32 right and i'm going to show nop or essentially masking of the threads using this gray color so there are eight threads of the warp they all are going to execute in top to bottom time manner so they all are going to execute first s not I'm just showing S0 as one instruction, but internally that is going to get converted into two instructions. One is a multiplication, then uh, an addition, but it suffices for our purpose that all of this is single instruction. They all are executing same instruction at the same time on different data items because ID is local to each thread. ID variable is local to each thread. So they are going to have copies of 32 copies, or in this case, eight copies of this ID. Okay, so that executes in parallel on different data items. Then S1 happens. S1 must occur only for the uh, odd number threads. Therefore, the even number threads are going to not execute any instruction. This is how the execution is going to happen. This masking is done by the GPU hardware, where it is going to mask, by the way, this execution of this condition is going to happen for all of them id mod 2 is going to get executed by all the warp threads it's just that depending upon its truth value vector of id equal to id is going to get executed by odd number threads. and similarly when s2 happens the other even number threads are uh, sorry odd number threads are going to execute no op in some sense that is those are going to get masked and after this and you can see that there is a lockstep execution all s not all s1 or no all s2 or no and after that all s3 right this is a lockstep execution there is nothing never going to happen that s0 and s1 are going to be in parallel for the warp threads for the same one or s0 and s3 are executing in parallel for the two threads of the same one that is never going to happen. okay um any questions on this uh, particular execution of warps with conditions? Okay. And if not, then I should mention that you can see that now, because there is this uh, execution like this, the parallelism has reduced. The parallelism was eight here. That has reduced to four, four, and then again eight, right? So the conditions are actually hurting the amount of parallelism on the GPU. And that is why we say that the data parallel computation where everybody does exactly the same computation on different data items, right? If that is the case, then GPUs are very good. Otherwise, you are going to make the code more and more sequential. You add more conditions and the code will become further sequential. Right? This problem is called as thread divergence because it adds sequentiality to the execution. Earlier, I mean, this would have been completely parallel. You could have finished it in one unit of time. Now you are going to require two. Therefore, there is a sequentiality across S1 and S2. And therefore, this thread divergence is going to reduce the amount of parallelism, reduce your performance on the GPUs. Right? Um, one question I have for you is that if I have this code, right, does this code diverge? Any suggestions? If yes, why? If no, why not? Okay, so um, 
this code does diverge and the reason is that okay there is some yes Ethan has said yes the reason why this diverges is because we have the number of iterations is dependent on the id that id differs across threads and therefore the number of times this code executes for different threads of the same work is different uh, zero thread executes zero number of times uh, thread i is going to execute i iterations of this loop and therefore this does have a uh, code divergence um, how about this code this is a modification of our previous code id mod 2 uh, where we had this in the else part i have added another if condition and then there is uh, the else part right if the vector is initialized to 0 1 2 3 like that uh, beyond whatever we have seen on the previous slide does this code diverge further okay rahul says no any other answers yeah you can see carefully that actually it will not diverge right so i'll, I'll skip that but yeah you can see that this condition is uh, going to help you uh, uh, with the odd values or the even values because the same values are going to be present inside the vector and therefore this condition is not going to be true for half of the threads and uh, for all the threads which come here. or uh, yeah okay so since thread divergence makes execution sequential uh, shouldn't we declare that the conditions are evil in the kernel code Well, if I have a, a condition like this, where vector size less than n, right? So this is the kind of uh, guard that we had for people to, uh, for all the threads to uh, execute only some portion, right? So we had such a guard. Uh, if we have this, then that is going to make sure that there is a condition, but there is no real problem because all the threads are going to execute this condition to true and the useful work is going to get done in S1, right? S2 could be empty, right? So therefore having conditions per se is not bad. So there's no divergence as such because the, all the useful work is being done in S1 itself. Uh, then can we say that the conditions which are evaluating to different truth values is actually epic, right? Is this a better statement to make? Okay. Depending about the if the condition the. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this seems to be reasonable, but there is a small example which gives us a different picture. So if I have an example like this, where the thread ID, global thread ID, is divided by thirty-two. Right. Sorry. Then that is going to execute S one, otherwise S two. Where is the thread divergence here? Is there a thread divergence? Well, it turns out that there isn't any because all the threads of the war of any war, they all are going to execute either S1 or S2. Part of the threads of the warp are going to execute S1 and part of the threads are going to execute S2. This is never going to happen because that is what for the zeroth war, this is going to execute uh, S2 and all other warps are going to execute as well. Therefore, this doesn't seem to be a problem as such, even if different threads are executing it to different truth values. Right? So the actual takeaway is that the conditions per se are not bad. If they are evaluating to different truth values, that is also not necessarily bad. If they evaluate to different truth values within a warp, then only there is threat average. So this also is a misconception that there should be no conditions in your GPU code, right? So there's again a misconception. Only if, if all the warp threads are executing the same condition, there is no problem. And if same truth value, there is no problem, okay? This you should remember. Okay, this you can try out as a kind of a homework exercise. You can try removing uh, the conditional evaluation by some way uh, such that the thread divergence doesn't occur.
we are given that this condition holds and then uh, you modify this program such that it executes it gives you the same output that is the uh, x gets the same value but uh, there is no thread divergence okay? so you can try that uh, in the homework uh, another homework that I can give here is the encryption and decryption, where uh, you, the cth character becomes c plus one, right? the character c becomes c plus one, right? and uh, circular so z becomes a. Uh, and then another encryption you can try as uh, c becomes c plus i, right? So see if uh, you can get the correct encryption code done and the correct decryption code done. Similar to what we had that hello world was h was replaced by G and so on. Uh, and there are other uh, parts of compression which you can try. And there will be some issues that you will face. And if you face these issues and want to discuss, feel free to mail me. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, spend some time on what we do as part of our group. But uh, if you want to learn more GPU programming, you can just, I mean, there are a large number of resources on NVIDIA website elsewhere. But uh, on my webpage also, uh, I have a large number of slides, uh, some of those we covered today. There are associated codes, very small, uh, carefully crafted codes, which tell you, which teach you exactly one particular aspect of GPU programming. And then there are lecture videos also from my course, which we did online. Those are also available uh, on that, so you can learn that. There is something called as Open ACC, uh, Open Accelerator Language which is actually very similar to OpenMP uh, syntactically. It has, of course, the GPU-specific aspects that you can uh, move data here and there, but that can be done only with pragmas. And that becomes really easy to learn as well as use. And the compiler that I have seen does a very good job of parallelization as well as identifying some checks. Um, uh, so that is relatively much easier compared to CUDA in case somebody wants to try it out uh, learn, uh, learn it. Uh, that is also another option which you can try. Uh, I also have uh, open ACC lectures uh, available from my web page. Feel free to uh, explore that. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the applications part, what we do in the group, uh, just to tell you what are the other uh, research directions that you can think about. First thing is all our ML DL applications, the back end is going to be your GP, right? Because there is so large parallel processing happening, plus there is large amount of data that we need to exploit parallelism. And therefore, uh, all of these applications, your TensorFlow, etc., all of these computations are going to be using uh, uh, GPU as the backend, right? So, uh, Tiano, everything, right? Then there are a large number of numerical algorithms, which are also very nicely parallel. Those can also be done nicely on GPUs, and GPUs are meant to be for such processing. A large amount of video processing games can also be done. Many times your laptop has a GPU so that your graphics, uh, both video-wise as well as uh, gaming-wise, uh, works better. So uh, that is one of the special use cases of GPUs. And then there are some domains which are not fully data parallel, but these can be useful for data, uh, modeling your computation in data parallel manner, such as graph algorithms which our group works on. And I'm going to show briefly a few aspects of that. Uh, I'll not take up too much of your time, maybe 15 minutes or so. Uh, so we actually have graphs everywhere, right? So does anybody know where all do you see graphs? And by graphs, I'm not talking about plots that we draw, I mean, X axis, Y axis, and so on. I'm talking about some other graphs, right? So where do you see graphs? Computer networks. Okay, computer networks is a graph. Good. Any other? Okay, Chaitanya says Google Maps is a graph. Very good. Any others? Okay, so social networks, maybe. Right, so uh, Adita has given another answer. The social networks can also be modeled as graphs. So there are some things which don't look like graphs, but those can be very nicely modeled as graphs. Right? So all of these are very nice examples. So social network that uh, Aditya was suggesting, all over Twitter, Facebook, 
Instagram. All of these are essentially uh, graphs where we have some people which which are marked which can be marked as nodes, and then the friendship between them can be marked as edges. Uh, you can as well have your programs modeled as graphs. If you have heard about control flow graphs, essentially your uh, computer program, let's say C program, CUDA program, all of that can be modeled as nodes or different instructions, typically called as basic blocks. And then edges signify how the control flows from one element to another. For example, there's a condition and therefore there are two outgoing edges, right? Yes and no. So all of the, and then there is a back edge whenever there is a loop and so on. Right? So your programs, we don't view programs as graphs, but those can be modeled as graphs. Your molecular interactions can be modeled as graphs. Right? So uh, your proteins are probably um, trying to combine with some other proteins or enzymes. And that relationship can be modeled as a graph. In fact, there are many biological problems which are more and more modeled as uh, uh, graphs. Similarly, you can have, uh, let's say, planets. They are uh, enforcing some force onto each other, right? Uh, we studied that it is proportional to their uh, masses, a product of their masses, and inversely proportional to the distance square of the distance between them, right? So that becomes some sort of modeling of the planets can also be done using uh, graphs. And of course, the road networks, uh, train networks, etc., uh, Google Maps, all of these are examples of graphs. Uh, graphs pose some challenges for processing. For example, they require large amount of synchronization. These are not very nicely data parallel. Why? Because I can have, let's say, I'm writing to this particular node from a thread which is operating on this node. And from another thread which is operating on this node, this might also be connected here. So this node is going to get returned to by multiple threads. And therefore, one requires synchronization. Not only that this synchronization is required, but also that this connection across these nodes is not known to the compiler. Because the graph is usually given as an input. So it is not available until a dot out is run at execution time. So when I'm compiling the program using NVCC, I don't provide graph as a parameter to NVCC. I just say, okay, take this graph algorithm, single source shortest path, minimum spanning tree, right? Max flow computation. Take this algorithm, compile it. At that time, compiler doesn't know how the graph is going to be. So all of this needs to be done at runtime. That becomes expensive. There is large amount of latency involved because the graphs are very arbitrary structures. These are not like our nice matrix-based or vector-based codes where memory is consecutive. It, I can say that, okay, this is node number one, and that is connected to node number six. And that is also connected to node number 62. And maybe node number one million, doesn't matter. Right? This, there could be arbitrary connectivity. And that creates problems for caches. So the memory latency is high. Almost all the nodes I'll have to fetch from RAM, and then the cache is going to go for a toss. On GPUs, anyway, there is very small cache available. And then there is large amount of thread divergence, right? Why thread divergence? Well, typical algorithms, they operate on a node and process its outgoing edges, right? How many outgoing edges can a node have? Well, it can go from zero to n minus one. Right? If you look at, for example, uh, uh, a social network. On social network, if you have uh, some celebrities like, let's say Virat Kohli or your Angelina Jolie or anybody, right? Amitabh Bachchan, all of these are going to have very large number of connections. And then on the other side, if you look at the poor uh, uh, faculty members from NIT and IIT, those are going to have very few connections to them. Right? So therefore, if a thread is assigned to process a node, the thread which is operating on an NIT or IIT faculty member is going to finish very fast. Whereas the one which is going to operate on uh, Amitabh Bachchan, that is going to take a large amount of so there is large amount of thread divergence that is going to come into picture. Right? Um, and similarly, as I was talking about that coalescing of memory, which happens uh, for a warp uh, threads, that also is going to go for a toss because the memory is not consecutive. Right? So the warp threads keep accessing very arbitrary graph elements and therefore performance wise, there is a large hit. One thing which I wanted to convey as I, I was, was thinking about uh, what to convey in these slides is not only what we do in our group, 
but also some basic aspects of how to represent the graphs. We know two ways to represent graphs on CPUs. What are those? We know two ways to represent graphs on CPU, in CPU memory. What are those? Okay, Chaitanya says adjacency matrix and adjacency list. So that is correct. So that is what I'm showing here. Adjacency matrix is a dense representation, n cross n, which looks like this, which means that for actually this graph example, I'm showing the adjacency matrix representation here. So a particular entry is one if that ith uh, vertex is connected to jth vertex, right? So this undirected graph, so this is going to be a symmetric matrix. And uh, this becomes a very nice representation. Uh, but importantly, finding the neighbors of a vertex is going to take the whole row, right? So I need to go over the whole row to figure out what all ones exist. And those are all going to be the neighbors of that particular node. Uh, because uh, uh, this zero means, OK, this uh, node number two is not connected to node number zero. Node number two is not connected to node number one. Node number two is, I mean, I'm not counting it as anything. Node number two is connected to node number four, right? So that is what is essentially this edge. Right? So I need to go over all of all of these zeros and ones to figure out, and therefore the complexity becomes order of the number of vertices. Uh, this is useful when most of the edges are present in the graph. That is, if most entries are ones, then it makes sense to store the graph in this manner. If most entries are zeros, then I'm going to store this in a dense matrix is not a very good idea. I can store it in a sparse format, that is adjacency list format. What does that do? Well, it just says that I'm going to have 0 to n uh, minus 1 number of uh, size of the array. And each entry is going to store exactly the elements to which it is neighbor of. So node 0 is a neighbor of 3 and 4 which essentially is this part. So I'm just going to store those in a list or an array, doesn't matter. But this becomes an adjacency list representation where I'm not storing all the neighbors. So therefore, going over the neighbors becomes proportional to actual neighbors which are present. So that becomes faster. Okay. Both of these are very good representations on CPU and uh, adjacency, both of these get used. For sparse graphs, we usually use the adjacency list representation. But the problem is that on GPUs, first of all, adjacency matrix is not going to be very useful for large matrices because one thing is it is not a sparse representation. Most of our graphs, real world graphs are sparse. Um, second, the GPU memory is going to be limited. So if you store all of this matrix, huge matrix onto the GPU, that's not going to help you. Adjacency list unfortunately uses pointers. And as we have seen, the GPU memories and CPU memories are separate. So how do we transfer pointers? Because those are going to contain addresses. Address 1000 on CPU might not be the same as address 1000 on the GPU. So how do I transfer this adjacency list from CPU to GPU? Therefore, on GPUs for graphs, we use a slightly different representation. We, one is rather simple. Another is a little complicated, but you will be able to understand. The first one is essentially edge list, which is also called as coordinate list format or CO format. So what we do is we just store all the pairs for the edges. So essentially each entry is an edge. Zero to three is an edge. So I just store that. And typically this gets sorted by the vertex ID. Right? So 0304 becomes the adjacency list of uh, node zero. Similarly, five is connected to one and four. Right? So like that, we store just the edges. This becomes very easy. I can store this on the CPU also. I can transfer it to the GPU and process it on the GPU. No pointers in there. Right? The second representation, which actually gets used in many graph representations, is called as compressed sparse row storage format or CSR format, which is derived from the adjacency list. How does that store it? It stores it using two arrays, right? This array size is equal to the number of nodes. This array size is equal to the number of edges. What are these values? 
when these values are the starting addresses of its adjacency list in this right which means that node 0 adjacency list starts at offset 0 in the other list in the other array and the adjacency list of node 0 contains this 3 and 4 which i have marked using a different color node 0's adjacency list starts at offset 2 in the second matrix in the second array and its adjacency list is 3 and 5 how do i know how many elements are there because this is a single array well i can do that by subtracting the next elements entry by the previous entry so 4 minus 2 is 2 therefore 2 has two neighbors 5 minus 4 is 1 and therefore 4 has a single neighbor uh, sorry uh, 2 has a single neighbor which is 4 this is 2th entry right so this is for node number 2 which is at offset 4 which is uh, uh, the value 4 that means 2 has a single neighbor 4 which is actually the case right and so on uh, if you look at these edges these are actually the adjacency lists concatenated together right so if you recall from the previous slide uh, the adjacency list was 3 4 3 5 4 0 1 0 2 all of these get concatenated and there are no pointers these are not pointers these are offsets in the array so if i represent this into the memory of the cpu copy it to the gpu and copy it back to the cpu there are no pointers involved the offsets continue to remain as they are and therefore this becomes a very attractive representation for gpus on uh, for graphs on gpu uh, there are some gpu optimizations which are going to be useful in case you work in this domain these i have categorized as computation related memory related and synchronization related there are different of them and uh, i think you might not be able to understand everything right now and i'll take probably a large time to explain this i'll skip this but if somebody has a interest in it you can uh, uh, contact me or uh, you can go through some of my lectures okay our group is called gajendra as vinith was uh, suggesting and there are a large number of different projects that we work on this is probably the second last slide um, and uh, but all of this kind of revolves around graph algorithms on GPUs. And there are uh, if uh, always opportunities if somebody wants to join our group. There are different, uh, uh, some of our work has uh, also received some recognition in the community, both India as well as also. All right, so that completes my talk. I think uh, I'm almost uh, close to 7.30. If there are any questions, I can take those up now. So uh, in the matrix multiplication uh, question, squaring mm -hmm. of matrix, mm -hmm. uh, you used n square threads uh, mm -hmm. to perform the multiplication. Mm -hmm. At what point do we stop adding threads? We could have added n cube threads as well, right? And done constant time operation per thread. Uh, yes. So actually, that was one question which I usually ask in my classes, which I didn't ask here. But yes, can you do n cube? Right? It turns out that. Uh, you can launch it with NQ, but you can't achieve much with that, not because of lack of parallelism. I mean, not because of uh, anything else, but because you can't perform that operation in parallel. The computation is actually writing to the result of I and J, right? The result matrix uh, with uh, indices I and J is being written to. And if you parallelize the K matrix, K loop, then there are n threads which are going to write to that same ij int. n threads are going to write to the same ij entry that is going to require you some synchronization that synchronization is going to take away our uh, advantage of parallelism and therefore we will lose uh, performance if we parallelize with nq however in general where do we stop? If the computation would have been actually parallel, is it okay to launch it with n cube threads? Well, um, in some cases, yes. 
the the answer actually uh, is not emphatic yes or emphatic no because in some cases you will get some benefit out of parallelism but as you increase the number of threads the amount of resources that gpu needs to store per thread in terms of for example number of registers that reduces and if that reduces your overall computation per thread might actually go might take larger time it, you might not see as many benefits as possible and therefore this becomes a little bit of uh, heuristic based uh, computation uh, heuristic by trial and error method where you try it out by increasing the parallelism but you don't get enough uh, performance so you reduce it of course the profiling is going to help you make a more informed decision because you, then you come to know whether the number of registers is small or is there some other synchronization related problem which is causing this and so on. but yeah in general my experience has been if the computation is relatively parallel uh, in general you do get benefit by increasing the amount of parallels increasing the number of threads yes sir thank you sir okay. any other concerns questions sir uh, in one of the previous slides where you you have mentioned what you are working on currently mm -hmm. uh, there was something called auto parallelizer mm -hmm. uh, can you please explain that a little bit like what is that project like what do you uh, aim to do with that it sounds a little interesting yeah. so auto parallelizers is a project done by my phd student prema who uh, said that okay i give you a sequential code and you go figure out what needs to be done by the compiler right so these auto parallelizers do exist uh, currently where uh, from sequential to parallel code directly Uh, this mapping gets done. Unfortunately, these auto parallelizers are not as effective for graph algorithms. Or even if you write the code in a slightly different way, even for array-based codes, the auto parallelizers fall short of uh, uh, extracting parallelism. So Prema tried to look at five parallelizers which exist in literature and uh, compared those, identified their uh, positives, negatives, and also did. Uh, suggested some ways in which these auto parallelizers can be made more effective uh, so that mm -hmm. was the work okay yeah. okay thank you okay. any other concerns questions all right so if there are no questions we'll stop here and i would like to thank again ipl nitk branch uh, rahul vinit for inviting me here and thank you to all the attendees for staying all the way till the end i know i was a little boring in between but hopefully you got something out of this and uh, if you have further interest in gpus feel free to explore more it's a beautiful world thank you so much thank you very much sir thank you thank you bye thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir